<clears throat> okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're now moving to our first parallel session. Um, and Deborah Jones is uh, joining us today to talk to us about um, to, uh, working towards an intercultural pedagogy. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Deborah. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, right, thank you. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm working at the University of Bristol at the moment, and I'm coming at this topic really from my role as an EAP teacher and um, as a researcher, I'm doing a doctorate in education. So I don't actually have a background in intercultural communication, um, so I'm not going to be referring to that very much, but a lot of the things that Professor Holiday mentioned very relevant to the talk and very relevant, I think, to the issues that we're considering as EAP practitioners. Um, so I'll just start with a bit about my background. Change the slide. Ah, no, that's yeah, right. um, so I've taught EAP in Japan, China, and the UK. And in China, I was working at one of the um, Liverpool University's campus in China, basically. So my role was to prepare students to come to the UK to continue their graduate studies. And at the time, I didn't really know very much about what was happening in UK higher education. I'd not taught. In universities in the UK. I didn't know much about internationalization or student recruitment or any of those issues. Um, so I came back to the UK in about what, 2016 after being away for 12 years and I worked in the in-sessional program at the University of Bath. Um, so I did some academic skills, academic literacy workshops and then I became the pre-sessional coordinator at Bristol which is something I've been doing for the last four years um, and recently I've moved back onto the in-sessional program at Bristol which is actually why I'm here today, because our pre-sessional starts this week. So if I was still doing a pre-sessional, I wouldn't be here. So I'm quite pleased about that. <laughs> um, but I think the pre-sessional is important for me because it's been quite key in developing my interest in intercultural pedagogy. So that's why I mentioned it. So I came out to the UK and suddenly realised what was going on with you know, people talking about internationalisation everywhere. And it seemed like you know, EAP is at the forefront of this in terms of our role uh, with the international students. So I wanted to to start doing some research into internationalization, the student experience, and um, you know, my role as an EAP practitioner in this. So I'm interested in um, internationalization in terms of learning and teaching in higher education, not specifically EAP. Um, I'm interested in what's happening in the subject departments, but obviously it's relevant to us as EAP teachers. And I suppose I'm interested in finding out if learning and teaching has adapted at all to these more international cohorts of students. Um, if at all. Um, so I kind of think if universities are going to claim to be international, which a lot of them do in their marketing, it needs to be about having an international curriculum and international pedagogy and not just about recruiting lots of international students. Um, I do take the point about the label international students. I'm not that happy with it either, but I can't think of a way of getting through this presentation without using that phrase. So I'm going to refer to international students, even though you know, we're generalizing about them in doing that. So, um, yeah, there have been a couple of points, I suppose, which have been significant in my teaching and my work as a practitioner, which have influenced my, my research interests. So, initially, I was interested in kind of curriculum internationalization issues, and that came from um, teaching at Bath on um, academic skills to MATSL students. And at the time, it was uh, entirely international students in that cohort, and predominantly students from China. And I remember looking at the reading list, and there were things on the reading list which I'd been reading when I did my applied linguistics MA about 20 years ago. And I thought well, that's quite interesting. You know, they're reading the same things as I was reading. I wonder if they're learning the same thing. Has the curriculum changed at all in the last 20 years? Um, luckily, I have you know, I know something about MAT, so if they've been engineering students, it would never have happened. But because it was my field, it kind of struck me how things have changed or not changed. And in the tutorial, some of the students were saying things like, well, this is a very interesting course, which I don't think it would be really relevant when I go back to do my, my role as a, an English teacher in my country. So it made me start to think about, you know, is the curriculum addressing what these students need and want? You know, how international is it? Um, so my first research interest was internationalization of the curriculum. And then I moved to Bristol to work on the pre-sessional. Um, pre-sessions were very different. I mean, bear in mind, I had no experience of working at UK higher education, I didn't even know what pre-sessions were till I came back and suddenly I was coordinating one. Um, and internationals at Bristol and Bath anyway, they're not just for international students, they're for all students. So they don't focus on language, they focus on um, 
know, academic communication uh, conventions, you know, the things that all of the students need to know. But professionals, they're only for students who have in, don't have English as a first language, uh, need to have an IELTS score to be able to join their course, and they're generally not from within the UK. So it's kind of much more specific group of students. And obviously there's a focus on language on a pre-sessional. There's also a focus on academic skills and academic communication. But I started to notice that it's more than that on a pre-sessional. Somehow we were almost teaching them to be students, teaching them how to behave, how to, how to learn within the English British system. And I started to feel a bit uncomfortable with this. I felt like what we were doing was sort of preparing them to be to receive the education we provide in the way we provide it and to be the kind of students we know how to teach. Um, and I, I felt quite uncomfortable doing this. It felt like we were feeding into this deficit narrative again, looking at what they don't know, what they can't do, teaching them to do things in our way, not acknowledging any kind of prior learning, at least any more than, you know, yes, we understand that you've had your way of doing it and that's fine, it's not wrong, but now you're going to do it this way, that kind of um, jumping between the cultures as if you go from one to the other. Um, and I felt like this was leading to a, an assimilation model of internationalization, which is not really something I wanted to be involved in. So yeah, it's not inclusive. I think that's what, what got me with some, but this excluding these students somehow. I wanted to find a way that was more inclusive. So this was the start of my doctoral research. And at the very beginning of my research, I read an article which had quite a, um, well, it was very influential in my thinking, I suppose. It's one of those situations where you have all these ideas in your head and you're thinking all these things and you're asking all these questions and you don't really know if you're going in the right direction and you read something and it says exactly what you've been thinking and asks exactly the same questions as you've been asking. So the article was by Jeanette Ryan, so it's on the screen here, and she coined this phrase of one-way internationalization, which is exactly what I felt was happening, I suppose, in the UK, having come back into it from being in Japan and China, where we're trying to present our way of doing things to the students and not getting anything back from them. Um, and this article was written in 2012, quite a long time ago. I read it in 2017. Um, I felt it was still relevant then. I think it's still relevant now. Um, and so, yeah, this, this was what I wanted to explore. How could we move away from this one way internationalization to something more inclusive? And I mean, some people, not, not in this room probably, but some people might say, and I've heard them say it, well, why is this a problem? Because if students choose to come to the UK, surely they want a UK style education. That's why they're coming here. So why do we need to change anything? We just sort of deliver what we do and then they, that's what they want. So I think it is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, the first point I'm not going to talk about too much because I don't think it really relates to the theme of today's conference, but the question of sustainability, international students now have more options about where they can go. They may not always come here, they may not choose to come here for very much longer, maybe we need to think about what we're offering them when they come. Um, so that's a sustainability argument, but that's kind of a different topic. Mainly um, today I want to really focus on the other two reasons why I think it's a problem, this idea of a one-way internationalization. Um, that we are, as educators, as educational institutions in the UK, we are missing an opportunity to not learn something from the students who are coming here. That just seems really obvious to me that if you've got students coming from these different backgrounds and different ways of thinking, different ways of knowing, different knowledges, we should learn something from them. And it's really kind of arrogant to think that we can't learn from them. But it feels like at the moment we're not really doing that. That was one reason why I think it's a problem. And the other reason is just basic social justice, it's not inclusive. Um, I went to a, a conference in Coventry recently and there was an academic there from South Africa. She's called Lynette Jacobs and she said something that really struck me. She said, inclusivity is not about the students adapting to the system, it's about the system being more accessible to the students. Um, and I think we're starting to do that in terms of students with again, disabilities, not a good term, but students with particular learning difficulties. We are trying to make education more accessible to those students, but we're not really doing it so much to international students, we're expecting them to adapt to our system. So I suppose that, that's why that, that struck me, social justice issue here. 
So I'm going to put a few quotes up from students just to get the student perspective on this, which I think is, is sometimes not, not heard, the student voice. So I'll let you read that. So that quote comes from recent research, which is comparing the experience of international students in the UK with international students in Germany receiving English medium education in Germany. Um, and I've kind of highlighted the term epistemic equals, which is a new term. I've come across this idea of a sort of epistemic democracy where the knowledge of all students is equally valued in the classroom. So I'm quite interested in exploring this a bit more. Um, but, you know, in answer to the people who say, well, you know, they come here to have our education, that's why they come. Well, they don't necessarily get what they're expecting. That student doesn't seem very happy with the experience that they've had. Um, you know, they feel that their culture is not being valued or their, their background is not being valued. And then there's this quote. So yeah, I think that quote alone is enough to make me want to keep asking these questions really, because you know that is not a good situation. And of course, you know, it's a little bit old now that, that research, but I'm pretty sure there are still students who feel like that when they come here, that they come full of confidence, they think they're going to do well because they are good students, they have done well in their own country, they have the qualifications, they've passed the language exams, they've achieved, achieved a required level, and they come here expecting to do well, and then this happens to them, and that's not a positive experience. So do you think that you know something needs to change really for, for the benefit of the students but also for our benefit and so I started to think about what well, this is the challenge I suppose that we we've got all these students we've been very successful recruiting all these students I think this the UK is the second most popular destination country at the moment for international students but you know what happens when they get here what are we doing to them when they get here and you know why are we not making the most of this situation that we're in so I was trying to find a more dialogic two-way approach to internationalization. And so I was asking these kinds of questions as I've been going through the research process in my ID. These are the kind of things I've been asking myself. And I think, you know, in answer to the question, should we do those things? I think, yes, we should. Could we do those things? Well, yes, we could, but then you get to the point of like, how do we do it? It's quite difficult to think about how do we achieve these things? They're quite big questions. Um, so that really, I think, is, is the, the challenge for us is to, you know, in EAP, in UK universities more, more widely, these are some of the questions that, that we need to be asking. And that's where we come to intercultural pedagogy. And that's where things are going to get tricky now, because I think my definition of intercultural it's not going to be the same as Professor Holiday's definition of intercultural, but bear with me um, and hopefully it'll, it'll make sense. So I've come across lots of different terms for this in the readings, intercultural, cross-cultural learning, cross-cultural pedagogy, intercultural dialogue, there's lots of different terms and I don't know if they all mean the same thing or if there are slight like subtle differences between them. Um, these definitions are from um, well, citation on the screens of Castro um, et al. Uh, and they are to do with intercultural dialogue. That's the, the definition they provided of intercultural dialogue. Now, I'm fine with that, apart from the word tolerance, which I don't like, because I think it's not a positive word. It basically means putting up with things that you don't like. So I don't see why we see tolerance as being a virtue. But leaving that aside, you know, open and respectful exchange of views. I can't argue with that. That's a good thing. That's what we want. But for me, these definitions and you know other definitions are, are possible obviously but these definitions they suggest learning about other cultures but possibly in quite a superficial way it doesn't have to be but it could just be in a very superficial learning about other cultures respecting difference but not necessarily letting it change you in that, that process so i came across this idea of transculturalism and I've noticed one of the later presentations is going to talk about this term transcultural. I wasn't brave enough to put it in my title. I thought I should stick to intercultural because it was closer to the theme of the conference. But 
maybe I'm moving more towards this concept of transcultural or intercultural. And these are some uh, explanations of what this, this means, what, what it could look like, what it could achieve. And these, you know, they're, they're, they're quite old now, they're not recent, and they, I'm pretty sure they're all from an Australian context. They seem to be doing a lot of research in this area in Australia about 10 years ago. A lot of the sources I was reading at the beginning of my study were, were from Australia written about the same time. But for me, this suggested it's not just learning about, it's learning from and being changed by, and that's what I liked about it. So I'm not saying you couldn't achieve that by using the term intercultural, but this is what I would like to achieve really in terms of how internationalization could work, how, how pedagogy could work. Um, so I'm calling it transcultural based on that definition. And I feel like it does extend the idea of intercultural just by implying change, it's transformative, the idea of transformation. Internationalization could be uh, transformative, which I'm not entirely sure it is at the moment. Uh, so I've come, come to this term, and this is the approach that I'm, I'm looking at at the moment. So now I've got to the stage of coming up with a research question from IRD, which is not easy because there's so many questions to ask. And the more you read, the more questions there are, and they're big questions. So how do you how do you narrow down and focus on the question that you're going to attempt to answer in your research? And as usual, I always get my answers through reading. Sometimes I just see something in a reading that says what I want to say that I haven't been able to formulate quite as well. And so I came across this question in a recent reading, a uh, very recent text actually, from someone who was at Liverpool University. So that kind of resonated with me because I used to work for their, their campus in China. I worked with a lot of students who went to Liverpool from China. It says East Asian students because it's specifically about students from East Asia, particularly from China. But you could take that word out and put international, or you could just take it out completely and just say students because Obviously, what we want is a pedagogical environment that's conducive to all students doing well, and all students fulfilling their potential, and all students being equally valued. But I think it's fair to say at the moment we don't have that. In the environment we have favours some groups of students more than others. So this is something to try to work towards. And so that's not going to be my question because I think the answer to that is no, we haven't, not at the moment. So what I'm interested in finding out, I suppose, is what would such a pedagogical environment look like? How can we reach this stage where all of the students feel valued, that all of the students contribute uh, and can you know, fulfill their potential? And I think at the moment, my feeling is that it has to involve the students in the process because as the teachers, as the educators, we can't come up with an intercultural pedagogy and ever impose it on the students. We decided to do this because we think it's better. But, you know, better for us, is it going to be better for the students? So I like this idea of students as partners, which is not a new idea, but I don't know how often it's been done to actually involve the students. And I think to do that involves us as teachers really thinking about our assumptions about teaching and learning. And you know, some of this relates to the, the plenary talk we just heard about you know, assumptions that we make about students from particular countries, which, you know, it is... You hear it a lot, even within EAP, but also within academic departments about things that certain students can't do. Um, so that's something on us to do. We need to challenge these assumptions. And so I found this quite interesting review of literature. Again, it's quite recent. There's a lot of really good research being done in this area recently. And the authors reviewed 49 articles which talked about pedagogy and teaching with international students in the UK. And they were trying to see if there were any kind of common threads, anything that could be synthesized into the basis of a definition of what intercultural pedagogy might look like. You know, is there anything we can get from these, these um, empirical uh, research? And they found that there wasn't anything that they could draw. There was, um, the findings were too disparate. People were doing their own thing in their own context, but there wasn't any kind of commonality, anything that could be you know, put together to form the basis of a, a framework. Um, so, their original aim didn't really work, but something they noticed through reading these articles, again, is this sort of prevalence of a, a deficit narrative where students are still seen as, as being you know, passive and not being partners. You know, we need to sort of change our way of thinking if we're going to see the students as partners. And, you know, it's not like the people who wrote those 49 articles are not trying to demonize international students by any means. They're, they're well-intentioned. They want to find a way to help them. But 
we've just got these assumptions that we can't seem to shake that the students need our help with things so we have to help them do these things and we're not seeing them as well as bringing anything with them to to the classroom so i think there is a really big need for teachers the eap teachers on subject is to shift our perceptions about our international students So there is a little bit of research into our lectures. As I said, I'm kind of interested in what happens in departments because you know, students don't come here to study EAP, they come here to study chemistry or accounting and finance or something. But obviously we have a role to play, but we're not you know, the only um, players in this. I think the departments have to kind of look at the way they're approaching international students as well. And the perceptions of lecturers in terms of their experience of teaching international students, is, these are the common themes that come up. Um, you know, there's a need for change, but we're not really sure how to do it, and we don't really have time because we're busy, we've got extra workloads, and the institution's not really helping us. So this is kind of what's coming through. Yes, we need to change it, but we don't really know how, and, and we don't have time. Um, and there's a lot of talk about, well, we have sessions about how to teach international students or teaching in the international classroom. A lot of the university run these sessions, um, and that's really the only support lecturers get. But some of those sessions, again, they feed into the sort of problematization of the students. We have this problem, how do we fix it? There's not much sense of um, you know, opportunities, for example. It's all problematized. And the article I just cited, the literature review of those 49 articles, one of the things they noticed was there's a lot of negative language around teaching international students. There's words like challenges, problems, obstacles, struggles. It's never a positive experience. It's like an ordeal that's being um, described. Um, and the other perception that comes through from subject lecturers is that language is the primary problem. Students don't speak English well enough, they don't write in English well enough. Interestingly, research into students is not primarily language, it's often the academic culture, the conventions that they found difficult to adjust to. Um, so there is a, a sort of difference of perception there, but it's kind of easy to say that language is a problem because then you can send students off to the language centre and say, you know, just fix this and teach them how to do this. So I feel like we're not really looking at this in the right way. So I did a very, how much is the time anyway? Five more minutes. Five more minutes to speak. Well, oh. well up to 10 and then five minutes. Oh, I'll just speak for five, that's fine. Okay, yeah. don't forget <laughs> another five. Um, yeah, so I did a very small scale research project for one of my modules in my ID. I, I just interviewed um, a few uh, subject lecturers and, and observed their classes. I didn't find anything particularly you know, revolutionary in this. It was very small scale. It kind of confirmed what I'd already read. Um, the interesting thing I think that's worth pursuing maybe in the research I did was that some of the teachers were not UK teachers. They were not, they were not from a UK background, they were international faculty members. Um, and so that might be something interesting to explore in terms of developing an intercultural pedagogy. If you have a lot of international faculty, maybe they can have some input into the process. There, there weren't major differences between perceptions of those academics and the, the UK ones, but there were a few small things that might be worth exploring in terms of developing a more intercultural or transcultural pedagogy. Um, so yeah, you come across, you know, this kind of attitude from lecturers and departments, you can sort of sense the slight indignation in that way, you know, I am expected to change my way of teaching for these students, but yeah, why not? I mean, they're different students who teach them differently or think about how to teach in a different way. So sometimes there's a bit of resistance, but you also do get, you know, positive uh, responses from uh, academics as well. They, they, they can see the potential here for it to be this co-learning experience where you can have a shared experience with the students. But I think we're still quite a long way from that, even though that was written in 2007. So I have a long way to go. So now we'll just get to the role of the AP, which is sort of <laughs> part of my remit. I haven't said much about it so far. Um, yeah, I mean, we're often seen as, you know, bridging the gap. That's quite a common uh, metaphor, I think, for EAP. We're bridging the gap between where the students have come from and where they're going to, which again, maybe you can't just jump back and forth like that from one culture to another, but that is often what our role is to kind of help students to make this transition. And um, again, another quote from my guru, Jeanette Ryan, who I've read a lot of her stuff and I, she really resonates with me. Um, you know, can we not meet them halfway across this bridge? Because at the moment they're going all the way across the bridge and we're just waiting on the other side for them to get there. And I kind of like this idea that we could be more of a, a two-way exchange. So I think this is something that we we can play a role in. I think we are limited because our role as EAP teachers is to prepare students for the expectations of their degree program. So in a way, we're limited by what those expectations are. Um, 
but I think, you know, we teach students we could we could change our approach in our classrooms, at least it's a starting point to try to make the experience um, more positive for the students. I think things that we, we could do, challenging our assumptions about teaching and learning. You know, we do have assumptions about how students behave if they're being active, if they're speaking, if they're interacting. We have all these expectations, again, which may, might come from our communicative language teaching here, how background of, you know, we're monitoring students, you must be talking, you must be doing this, I, I need to hear it. And it probably doesn't create a very nice environment for the students. Thinking about our assumptions, where do they come from? Are they still valid? Can we change them? Can we achieve our goals in a different way? Trying to find out more about what they've experienced in their own educational background, just to show the value of it, really. Because we have a lot of stereotypes about what they've experienced, and we may be wrong about current space of education in their country. We may not know as much as we think. But it just asking them about it shows interest, at least. You know, it shows something. Um, as opposed to the kind of, yes, this is how we do things here, which we have a tendency to say, this is what we need to learn to do in the UK, because that's how we do it here. So just talking to them about the teaching styles, how they, I mean, they're individuals as well, that's the other thing. Some of them may have liked a different teaching style in, in their home country. Some of them might prefer the teaching style here, but they're not going to respond in the same way just because they're from the same, same place. And negotiating with them, you know, and asking them, how did you feel about that activity? You know, that sort of affected sense of teaching, you know, how did you feel about it? Do you feel comfortable, uncomfortable? Could we do things in a different way? What would work? I think that negotiation, again, is more working towards seeing them as partners rather than seeing them as these people that we're trying to mould into something different. And talking to you about what we're trying to do. And justify what we're doing. So it's not like, well, this is how we do it in the UK. You know, this is the UK higher education system, so that's why we're doing this. I think we need to give them a bit more than that, really, you know? justify the activities and why we've chosen to do it in that way, because they might be other ways to achieve the same goal. Try to be more flexible and not just dismiss what they say, because it doesn't match our assumptions of what we think you know, good teaching is or being a good learner is. Um, be a bit more open, perhaps. And the last one is quite interesting, because I think this is something that subject lecturers could do really well, is to encourage students to bring content academic articles in their own language, in their own um, background, read them, come to the class and summarise what's going on in research in their field, in their country. You know, it doesn't all have to be in English. I don't know what the rules are, the policies are these days, but it's not that long ago that I was telling students you can't use non-English sources, you have to use English sources in your writing. I don't know if that's still the case. But, you know, why, why can't they read it in their own language, come and summarise what's being said in their own language? They can write about it in English, but just including it values it. Well, you can only read sources in English. It's like nothing else is important. And I think even though in EAP we are supposedly trying to give them skills and strategies to read in English, that's what we do. But I think we're still valuing maybe having activities where they can read something in their own language and then come and share it with the class in English. They're still practicing summarising skills. They're still practicing English communication, but they're using knowledge from you know, their own background, not just with our knowledge. And I think at least it would show that we're valuing what they bring. And I think that's what we need to move towards. It's not quick and it's not easy, but I just think that's some, some ideas for how we could take this forward. So again, I'm going to leave you with a quote from a student or from um, an article written by a Malaysian student who went to study in Australia, so he had some experience of that. And I like that because, again, it's, you know, students are quiet, they don't talk, they don't ask questions. It's like, well, maybe we need to think about our role in that. And I like this because it mentions, you know, race and gender as well. We will have these assumptions about race and gender. Assumptions about cultural backgrounds are the same, but we don't think of it in that way. So that is my final slide, I think. This is quite an interesting link if you're interested in getting loads of good reading sources on internationalisation. I've got loads of really good articles from that link. So that'll be on the slides. Um, obviously, there's lots of references there for you to look at later. And um, that's it. So I've, I've done it in the time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Deborah. We did start at five past, so I hope people don't mind. Uh, just an extra five minutes uh, for questions. So Sarah's going to start with questions on the chat, if there are any from our attendees online. Just up at the top. Oh, in more. 